Ophelia Engelhardt Funke is a German actress who spent her entire career in a wide variety of roles at Hanover Re. Since 2017, uh, she's been at Hanover Re in the US uh, as Senior Vice President and Chief Risk Officer, although she's actually based in Germany uh, or speaking to us from Germany today. Uh, Ophelia um, uh, spent uh, many years at university uh, before um, uh, becoming an actuary uh, and has a doctorate in stochastic optimization from the Technical University of Klaus Dahl, I hope that's the right pronunciation, pronunciation in Germany. Uh, and she's a member of the, uh, the uh, Actuarial Society of Germany, the DAV. Ophelia, over to you. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, good morning, good day and good afternoon uh, to everyone from my side as well. Um, it is right, I am currently presenting from Germany out of my daughter's room. So if you see Alice in Wonderland and Hunger Games in the back, that's not my favorite movies, that's hers. <laughs> but I, um, I usually sp spend my time in the US. So I just wanted to clarify, I am working out of the US it is just happens to be for private reasons that I'm right now that I spend this time in Germany. Thank you for the opportunity to speak here. Um, I just wanted to share some of my perspective in how how it feels you know, to be a risk manager of a subgroup within a subgroup. We have a higher, you know, we have more entities involved. We are, we call ourselves kind of the Life and Health America family. So we write life and health business in the US and there are several entities involved in different countries. And that by itself kind of forms their own subgroup, which is interesting because then you deal with different types of frameworks. So I called my presentation Steering Risk and Capital Through, through International Waters because there, between the countries that I'm referring to, there will be lots of water in between, ocean water. And in order to just get an overview of what I'm talking about. I'm just looking at the companies right now that do somehow affect or concern me. So there certainly is our German parent. And because they are in Germany, their statutory accounting regime is HTB. And that is to an, to an effect important for me when I think about either seeding business there or wanting any other type of support before I ask, I should at least have an idea about how that could possibly affect their balance sheet and, and PL. Then of course, because they are you know, an international company, they have IFRS, that's important. They are part of the EU, that's why Solvency II is important as a solvency regime. And um, we do have an internal model for the group with like, just like many large reinsurers, that makes a lot of sense for us. And uh, then, of course, aside from the Solvency II Solvency that we're looking at, the rating agencies are very important as a reinsurer. Our clients definitely look you know, at us to be around when things get messy. And uh, that usually helps if you have a lot of financial strength. So that German parent, among other, you know, many, many other companies that they own, they do own a UK holding company. That UK holding company by itself uh, owns a US holding company. That really, well, what does that US holding company do? It owns other companies. And that US holding company does own our parent company in Bermuda that I'm also the CRO, CRO of. So there's a life and health company in Bermuda that has chosen, and you can do that in Bermuda, and that will become important later. That company has chosen voluntarily to pay taxes in the US. So we're not taking advantage of the zero tax rate in Bermuda. We have chosen to pay taxes in the US and there are certain advantages of doing that. That is something to keep in mind. Um, from a Bermuda statutory perspective, yes, Bermuda statutory is important for our purposes here. We can pretty much assume that that is equal to IFRS. So that makes my life easier. Uh, that's why I put them all both in the same, in the same line. From and so that's important from a balance sheet income statement perspective. And then from a solvency perspective, we actually have two, and I would say equally important regimes here. 
although not everybody may agree with me, but uh, I, I would say they are both equally important. There is what we call the Bermuda regulatory piece, which is the BSER, Bermuda Solvency Capital Requirement. So that's the, the required capital that you need in Bermuda as a Bermuda company. And then there's the Bermuda Economic Balance Sheet, which is the Bermuda Economic Balance Sheet is pretty similar to a Solvency II balance sheet. And it is pretty much an economic balance sheet where you look at all your cash flows and you discount them and that's that's your liabilities and you look at all your assets and that's the other side of your balance sheet. And then you look at that required capital that you've just calculated, that BSCR, and you take that and you calculate a cost of capital for that in every year and then you present value that and that's your risk margin and that comes out of your available capital. And that's the, the available capital then in total that you have. So that's quite comparable to Solvency II. The differences that we have there are that number one, the risk margin, because it's based on a different type of required capital, um, it can end up very different, although the principle is the same, the number itself can be very different. And then on the, play, the liability calculation side where you look at your cash flows, the difference is that the Bermuda economic balance sheet first starts with, yeah, with IFRS. And that means that certain transactions that we have, that although we are assuming reinsurance risk, we may not assume that reinsurance risk in the form of reinsurance treaties. It could be in different forms. And because the Bermuda EBS follows IFRS, you have to look at, okay, how is that form accounted for in IFRS, and then you have to use that same accounting in on your Bermuda economic balance sheet. So you may end up with having also different available capital than for solvency too. And then there's the, in Bermuda, there's also something called CISA, the commercial insurer's self-assessment, solvency self-assessment. I kind of compare that to the ORSA that we know from, from solvency too, and also from many US states. Um, so that's our own assessment of how we think we, how solvent we are. And we pretty much, not 100%, but we pretty much use our group internal model and solvency too for that purpose. And what is important is that that CISA report gets also filed with the regulator. And ever since the pandemic started, we are actually, we also have to communicate to our regulator on a quarterly basis, what our CISA ratio is. So how solvent we think ourselves that we are. So that's why I would call that also some kind of regulatory basis because it is communicated to the regulator just as much as our financial statements and just as much as our regulatory um, solvency. So that Bermuda parent then owns, if you move over to the right, owns the US operating subsidiary. So for that US operating reinsurance company, US statutory, of course, is important. But so is IFRS because they know they have a parent where IFRS is important and they need to make sure um, that they understand how that works. And then ultimately that goes up to the German parent and the whole group where IFRS is an important um, accounting regime. From a capital requirement, there's the US RBC, so also the US statutory capital um, that determines our regulatory solvency. And then there's an ORSA requirement. It's not exactly the same. It's the same uh, the same uh, word, but it's not exactly the same as for solvency too, but it's kind of similar. And it's our own view about our solvency and how it's going to perform in the future. And we are looking at that from an RBC perspective, but also from a, our own internal model view where we're using the internal model and solvency too. And then that US subsidiary, that operating subsidiary also has a captive, which is also in the US, uh, but in a different state. So what is kind of interesting in the US and something to keep in mind that we don't have one regulator, we have 50, because every state has their own. And while they are in total, you know, governed by uh, some, by the NAIC, um, each state has their own way and there are nuances of how they implement certain 
certain laws and regulations, and they may differ. And sometimes the nuances are what is important. So there are lots of water, lots of water between the US and Bermuda, and lots of water between Bermuda and Germany or the EU. So that's why we are, these are the international waters that I'm talking about. And then if you move over to the left, um, you can see there's another Bermuda company that is currently very small still. Um, that is a Bermuda segregated account company. So it's still a life and health company with a life and health insurance license in Bermuda, but it is kind of a different license than the Bermuda parent. And it is a company that operates different segregated accounts under one license and then has different transactions walled off from each other in those segregated accounts, kind of like Protect Itself, very similar concept. So how, one question that we had in the previous slide is why do we have all those boxes and arrows? You get those questions a lot. And I had those questions when I started, you know, <laughs> in reinsurance for many years. I'm like, why on earth do we need all those companies and all those boxes and arrows? Why are there so many on this page? And I want to talk you through that there's actually risk management reasons when I look at risk management as also including capital optimization, that there's good reasons to have all those different boxes and arrows in on the page and I have lots of water in between them. So all we do in our little subgroup, all we do is we assume life and health reinsurance business in the US. Every time we want to have a piece of business, we have to think about should that type of business stay in the US operating company or should it go elsewhere? And if it should go elsewhere, where should it go and in what form? And the reason why we have to do that is because we want to be as efficient as possible with the capital that we have. And why is that? You know, you could say a CRO, why, why aren't I trying to just gather as much capital as possible in my entity and that makes it nice and solvent and then I don't have to worry about um, conversations with, <laughs> with regulators or whatever. But we have to keep thinking about every dollar that we save and cost of capital is really a big cost item that we have. Every dollar that we have, we can either keep it in the entity and finance further growth. We can dividend it out to our shareholders and make them happy, or we can pass it on to clients and they can then either do the same two things as above, or they will also pass part of it on to their customers. And that makes products more, more affordable and that will help close the protection gap that we still have in the world. And even in the US, there's a huge portion of the US population that is still uninsured or underinsured when it comes to life insurance. So if we have a block of business or a business opportunity, first we look at, do we like the business? And that should be independent of the form that we assume it. It should be independent of a specific regulatory regime. It should be independent of a specific accounting regime. It should be purely our own economic view from a group perspective. So we really only use our internal model that should show our economic view. And we don't look at, we look at the risk only regardless of the form, it's substance only. And then economically that tells us, okay, we like the business. That means, okay, we would like to assume this risk into our group, our reinsurance group. And only after that comes the question, where is the best place to actually put it? So the question, should it stay or should it go? That's where all of a sudden form matters. Some of the business that we would like to assume comes in a certain form that our US operating license doesn't even allow us to take. But in different countries, the license requirements are different. So maybe it can go to, a, in, to the, our Bermuda parent. That is usually the, the first place where we go. And it may be from our client side, they may not be as agnostic as we are to the form in which they see the risk as we are agnostic to the form in which we 
assume risk. They may want a certain form because they, that allows them to achieve whatever they want. But in many times, whatever you can do with a stop loss reinsurance agreement, you can also do via structuring certain notes. You can do also do via structuring swaps. Plus there are many other forms where you can do pretty much the same thing as what a reinsurance stop loss can do. But not all of them can be kept in the US. So some of it can't even touch the US simply because of licensing requirements. What is clearly you know, welcome and starts entering the group from the US will be anything that is written in pure reinsurance form. And then we have to look at, okay, once it's a reinsurance treaty, if it enters via the US, we have to look at, is there any type of US statutory strain from the accounting regime? That could come from high reserving requirements. It could come from acquisition costs that we have to pay out and that under US statutory, you cannot activate. There's no gap and there's no DAC like in IFRS. Um, or does it come from US capital requirements? Because the RBC is a very formulaic, it's very clear you know, what your capital is. You take your pieces from your balance sheet and do, you multiply them by certain factors. And in the end, you get your required capital. And that may be adequate for certain types of business and it may not be adequate for other types of business, which is why certain types of business are better off in a different environment. So the different requirements from US statutory, we have to compare those with the same requirements for the same business, but in Bermuda. So what is the capital requirement there? from a CISA versus a BSCR perspective. What is the reserving requirement there? Economic balance sheet means best estimate. Capital requirement means, means, means risk margin. Or we have to look at Germany or maybe even other countries. We usually don't go that far, but there may be reasons in, uh, in different times. So the economic balance sheet, solvency to IFRS, HGB even, and then the Bermuda BSCR, all those have to be considered and see which entity is the best one to be a home for the business. In the end, once we have looked at all this analysis, you can come up and that's what we do in risk management. We come up with certain guardrails and it's most of the times you can say that the shorter term business is more likely to stay in the US. Shorter term, not so much life, more health business, shorter term and health business usually stays in the US and is efficient there. Um, Whereas longer term life business and not business in non-traditional forms would usually go to a different country, usually to Bermuda. That's how the, that's kind of the result of what we've been seeing over time. If we put a little bit of theory around this, the question can come up of, you know, why doesn't everything economically, why doesn't go everything go to the parent to Germany? They have the biggest balance sheet. They have the business from all over the world. They have you know, the best diversified uh, portfolio that you can think of as an international, international reinsurer. So theoretically, from a Solvency II perspective, everything should go to Germany um, because that gives us the best diversification, which means from a legal entity perspective, the lowest capital requirement. And from that, that means the lowest cost of capital, the lowest risk margin. So we also have higher available capital if we seeded everything there. So why don't we do that? You know, why do we still have all those boxes and errors <laughs> on the page? Well, there are lots of buts, you know. Yes, I would like to seed all of my business to Germany, but why can't I do this? Well, when it comes in via the US, uh, in 2017, actually, by year end 2017, uh, the US implemented this so called BEAT. So, what does the anti abuse tax? Was the, I forgot actually what the acronym stands for. It's a penalty tax for anything that you assume in the US and then seed out to a, an affiliate entity, for example, to your German parent. So 
And it's, it can be huge and it's not based on profits. It's really based on, from a reinsurance perspective, we could say premiums that you're seeding up. Well, so in the end, if we did, if we simply assumed business in the US and seeded it to Germany or to any other affiliate in a non-US taxpaying environment, we would have giant um, penalty taxes that we have to pay much more than we have profit. So anything sizable that has a sizable premium volume cannot be ceded to outside the US tax environment. So that's one reason why we don't do a lot of retrocession. Then there are collateral requirements. So yes, it is very nice, the fact that the US and the EU have signed the covered agreement, which legally would get rid of any, any required collateral other than what the two legal entities um, that are part of a transactions other, transaction other than what they would agree to among themselves, but there would be no regulatory requirement for collateral. And they've done that, I think, also in 2017 or 18. But that doesn't really mean a lot yet because the different US states first have to implement the covered agreement such that it's actually valid for the business that we could possibly see. So right now, well, as of today, no more, <laughs> but as of yesterday, um, we would still have to, despite the covered agreement, we would still have collateral requirements if we ceded business from the US to Germany, simply because Florida still needs to do the exact implementation. Um, then there is from a financial statement, there's the German gap, the HTB, which kind of works similar, or I keep it in my mind, I try to keep things simple. I'd say it's similar to how US statutory works in the sense of that there are high reserving requirements. There's no DAC to activate acquisition costs. So it's business that would not be well housed in the US because of statutory strain can usually be considered to also have that same effect on German gap. So it's not well housed in Germany either. And then, well, you know, business would be easy if it wasn't for the clients, but you have to think about that our clients are US companies and they have certain preferences on you know, which legal entity they want to face. And that's well understandable. So lots of buts. And in the end, we only concede small types small volumes, let's put it that way, small volumes of business to Germany if we wanted to. So then instead, let's look at that US tax paying parent in Bermuda. That is really our main go-to place. And now we understand why that parent company has elected to pay taxes in the US. Although they could have, you know, being a Bermudan company, they could have taken advantage of the low tax, uh, tax rate in Bermuda. Um, that's to avoid that beat that um, base erosion and anti-abuse tax, now I'm, it's coming back. So they are, we want to avoid that penalty that we will have to pay if our business went to affiliates that are outside the US tax environment. So although it's in a different country, it is still within the same tax jurisdiction, the business that goes there. So now it becomes a lot more economic. Remember we have decided First, from an internal model, pure economic view, regardless of the form, we have decided, do we like the business? If the answer is yes, then it's very likely that the Bermuda economic balance sheet, which is not exactly the same as our own view, but it's much closer, will also show that this business is well housed in Bermuda. The VSCR, interestingly, the capital requirements, so the economic balance sheet, the assets over the liabilities on your economic balance sheet in Bermuda, they are similar to Solvency II and on an economic basis. But the BSCR, the capital requirement, so the available capital from the economic balance sheet, um, very close to Solvency II, Solvency the required capital in Bermuda, again, keeping things simple, is much closer to the US environment, like the RBC, where you, you take your economic balance sheet, but then 
you take off certain positions from there and you apply certain factors and then the and you get some diversification and all that but it's all formulaic really based on a giant excel spreadsheet and then the formulas will tell you exactly what your capital requirement is regardless of how sensitive the business is that you're actually writing and then there's the CISA where we look at our internal model and that one should be okay because we've already decided that we wanted to take the business into the group so really the having that economic balance sheet bscr and CISA um, capital framework really solves many of the u.s statutory and rbc problems where requirements would simply be redundant and above the economic view and why would we want to hold something that is you know above or what we think is appropriate again nothing comes without a but <laughs> there is um other issues appear when we are in bermuda for example if you remember one of the earlier slides that all we do is we write life and health business and then from the statutory perspective, the majority of the health business actually stays in the US operating company. Well, what is left for the Bermuda parent? It's really just life business. So more or less automatically, that Bermuda parent becomes more or less a monoliner just writing US mortality business. So that's certainly not a good idea from a diversification perspective. We're getting really high capital requirements because of lack of diversification. And there's not many places where we can go and seed off portions of that business because of the beat, because of the tax requirements or the penalty that we would otherwise pay. So the solution that we found for that is to really, we still seed out some of the risk, not a lot of volume, but tail, like the far out tail risk that really determines our capital. We seed that out to our German part, uh, German parent. And that makes the volume or the premium volume because it's so far out, out in the tail, makes the premium volume relatively small such that the penalty tax doesn't kick in, but it's enough such that it reduces our capital requirement. And then of course, you know, it increases the capital requirements in Germany, but they have all that diversification. They can diversify with all the other business. So we are getting a little bit of the benefit from that large German and well, large, well diversified German parent, um, without getting the penalty from the from the base erosion and anti abuse tax by doing it in a tail risk, really just stop loss form. Uh, regulations in Bermuda to consider once you have a company there. There's the Economic Substance Act, and that is relatively new. Um, which is why there's not a lot of precedence and not a lot of like common market practice on how people actually fulfill that. However, we are lucky because our parent chose to pay taxes in the US, they are not subject to the Economic Substance Act. So that's a good thing. That is still important for our segregated account company, but I'm not going to talk a lot about that. Um, so that's at least one part that we don't have to really worry about, but then there's still the head office requirements in Bermuda that state yet you have to direct and manage your business from Bermuda. And unfortunately, fortunately or unfortunately, the regulations are not as clear sometimes as we wish. We still have to come up with our own interpretation. Sure, we can say, you know, managing the business from Bermuda means that we set up a giant company there with know just as many employees as we have in the US and that way it's it's crystal clear but that would certainly not be efficient and we don't want to waste our clients and the end customers money because that's what would happen if we ensure if we operate non-efficient then our reinsurance becomes more expensive which means our clients products become more even more expensive and that doesn't help to close a protection gap or anything um, so we want to be as efficient as possible, but we still need to figure out how efficient, you know, we can't just have a post box in Bermuda and no, no people. So finding the line there is kind of interesting. And then between Bermuda and the US, currently um, there's no covered agreement yet. 
but there is the NASC credit for reinsurance model law, which kind of does the same thing as the covered agreement between the EU and the US, but each state can then pick the countries um, that they feel have adequate supervision such that no collateral is required for transactions between entities in those different countries. And apparently Florida has just adopted that and that's really wonderful for us. So going forward, we're excited to see collateral requirements go away um, for new business at least. But prior to that, what we have the AG48 captive, I also wanted to give you an idea of why we have that. That is really there to have alternative ways to collateralize statutory reserves in the US other than with the traditional admitted assets or, um, that we have. So if we think about, you know, here's a picture again of the, the boxes and arrows and why each one of them is on the, pa on the page. So starting in the right down corner, the AG48 captive allows us to collateralize statutory reserve, US statutory reserves, independent of anyone's rating. And that is different from the current environment with our Bermudan parent, where also the collateral requirements are really low, but that is because they are so well rated. And while we expect them to remain well rated and all that, there's no guarantee that that's gonna be the, the case. So if their rating were to drop, currently then our collateral requirements will go up. So the AG48 captive is a way to have the collateralization without being dependent on rating agencies. So that is helpful for that. Then we have the US operating subsidiary. They acquire the business, but that's not all they do. They retain some. And because they have the subsidiary, the subsidiary of that Bermuda parent, whatever capital they hold also supports the requirements in Bermuda. So this is kind of this capital in the in the US operating company kind of does a little bit of double duty um, in the sense that it supports the US business, but it also supports the requirements in Bermuda. Then we have the Bermudan parent and our main retrocessionaire. That Bermudan parent is a certified reinsurer that also pays US taxes. So the reason they are there is to avoid the penalty tax. That's why they're paying US taxes. And they are what we call a certified reinsurer. That means that the collateral requirement for statutory reserves ceded to them are really low. They're based on ratings, yes. We don't put not paying beat. And they have this economic balance sheet that reasonably reflects our own economic view of the business. So it usually matches relatively well. Then we have the US holding company. Well, why do we need that? There's another box on the page. Well, you need, in order to be a US taxpayer, which we're so proud of, that our, our Bermudan parent is a US taxpayer and that helps with the, with the penalty tax. Um, but you need a US owner. Someone in the U US needs to own you in order to be able to elect that US tax paying. And that makes a lot of sense because the IRS, they want to have a go-to place, right? Just in, in case you, know, you owe taxes and you don't pay them. There has to be something in the US where they can go to. So that's why we need the, the US holding company for. And then there's the German parent, of course. I mean, we need them and they need us. It's a, it's a mutual relationship, I would say. And they are definitely the largest balance sheet for our business, the best diversification. So they are able to take the tail risk that for us as a monoliner would otherwise really, really increase our, our um, economic capital requirements. And then there's the, on the left side, I just want to really touch really quickly on that. There's the Bermuda Segregated Account Company. This is really there for business that we want to intentionally wall off in segregated accounts or protected cells. It's kind of this, the same thing. And then use other investors' money to back the capital there rather than our own. So there could be, if you think about, you know, what how large the industry's balance sheets are compared to a reinsurer, regardless of how big a reinsurer that is. But when one or two or three reinsurers can never, um, 
actually serve all the the needs in the in the industry. So we do need other investors, and a segregated account company is kind of helpful for that. So we've assumed the business. We have found out where to best place it and why we need lots of boxes and arrows. So let's assume that that business that we have placed around the world is nice and profitable. So profits come in, where do they go? Somebody wants to see those profits, right? Ultimately, it's of course our German parent that would like to see those profits come in as dividends. And that way, in order to receive them as dividends in a current year, they have to submit it prior to an HDB cutoff date. So prior to a certain date, we have to declare and pay our dividend. And that date is really determined by whatever the cutoff date is for the German gap accounting, so the, the HDB. So that's at minimum a reason why we, as risk managers, of even though we work in a different country, we have to have a little bit of knowledge on about German gap. Then there's the UK holding in between. Well, guess what? They have a different cutoff date. Apparently what they have is year end. Then there's the Bermuda parent. They pay their dividend on IFRS earnings because that's their statutory financial statement on a standalone basis, which in their IFRS earnings are not even known prior to those cutoff dates in the UK or the cutoff dates in Germany. So that's kind of a challenge, right? Then we have the US operating subsidiary and the AG48 captive. They also make their profits and they are happy to and would like to pass them on as dividends. But it's a different accounting regime. So while Bermuda entity looks at IFRS, the US entity has to look at statutory earnings in order to determine the dividends that they can pay up to the Bermuda parent. And again, there are different filing dates and different cutoff dates as to when we will know how much we can declare. There's always a way to play safe. That many times that would be disappointing to our parent, but we can certainly pay safe and only pay out dividends from prior year's earnings. Or we can develop a certain risk appetite and ask our regulators for approval and pay out whatever we have left from prior year and then possibly something that we have already earned during the current year. That only works with approval and there's a certain risk to it because 364 days of the year may go wonderful and then there may be that last day of the year um, that could theoretically wipe out all our earnings and then what do we do the next year. So this is also interesting and made me or oh, helped me realize why well, even dividend payment somehow is a risk topic and has to be a part of our risk management. This looks like this is the same side. So now we've looked at earnings, we have looked at cutoff dates and how much we can, who can pass on how much to each parenting entity or each upstream entity, um, we also have to look at other metrics just beyond profits. Just because we have profits does in our relevant accounting regime doesn't mean we can pay it out. So we have to look at each legal entity and have to look at what is the liquidity, what is the solvency, what is the total risk position of the legal entity after a potential dividend payment. And all, only if all of that is okay, then will we be able to actually um, pass on that, those profits or a portion of the profits. And that's why our system of limits and thresholds is so important because they will clearly tell us how much we can pass on and how much we cannot. And over the years, so I've, as I was introduced, um, they mentioned that I have been working in many, many different roles and that was they were all very interesting. I've only actually moved towards risk management um, during the past four years. So what I've learned over time in risk management through international accounting regimes, my personal takeaways are really how interesting it is as a risk manager to connect all those dots and bring together all the different 
departments and what they do in a company and not only in a company, but in our subgroup and then eventually in the whole group. And risk management includes a lot more topics than just the quantitative risk monitoring, risk measurement, internal model. There's really, it's almost every part of the entity is somehow touched by risk management. I have learned to say goodbye to being an expert because there are just so many topics that I cannot possibly uh, grasp them all. But I need to try and understand, at least on a high level, and I can, luckily, there are lots of really good experts in the company that I can trust, but every once in a while, I need to try and understand whether something is truly a requirement, or maybe it's our interpretation of a requirement, or maybe it's some, just something that we've always done that way, and it doesn't necessarily have to be done that way. And then we can do it differently and become more efficient. And that just means, and I think that's kind of a nice segue maybe into the next um, presentation, which is mostly about this communication, that I realized how much more time than I originally thought I have to allocate to listening and trying to understand the different experts in the, within the group, and also then to whatever I understood to be able to explain that to the next one who is, you know, waiting for the dividend and doesn't understand why I can't make a clear, a clear commitment yet and all these different topics. So allocating a lot of time to listening and explaining has become a big part of the job in risk management. And that's why it's fun and interesting and exciting. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and see if you have any questions. Well, thank you very much, Ophelia. That was very interesting and also very clearly explained. Um, very, uh, very good. Um, now, I, I don't, uh, I don't currently see any questions on uh, Slido. It's maybe because I haven't updated it or something. But I was going to ask you a question. Uh, I mean, I guess with the move towards international capital standards, do you think that some of these opportunities? to optimize capital management will disappear? Or do you think there will always be uh, these, kinds of, uh, these kinds of opportunities? Well, I, I don't think they would disappear because I'm doubtful that local capital standards will disappear. I mean, it will only disappear if the local requirements go away. And yeah, what you called opportunities, I would rather call them constraints. I mean, ideally, I would like to have everything in one place and everybody knows that that's the best, <laughs> the best diversification. It's more that looking at the constraints to that prevent me from doing the most efficient, from a theoretical standpoint, the most efficient thing. And that's when the local requirements come in. And as, as long as those don't go away, I don't see capital optimization going away. Okay, no, thank you. I think what, what inter international standards will do is they would they would limit arbitrage opportunities, which uh -huh. is what I wouldn't really recommend anyone doing that anyway. <laughs> I mean, from a you really have to look at your at your own view first. Right. That's kind of the truth. What do you think economically of the business? Yeah. And that can never be decided by any local standards that you can arbitrage each against each other. It's the first view is our honest and economic view. Do we like the business? And then everything after that comes second. And that's where the, you know, the regulatory requirements come in and the local ones. Yeah, I don't see them going away. I hope so, but <laughs> I don't see it. Okay, thank you. Do um, do ask questions if you'd like to uh, uh, quiz, uh, uh, inquire about any aspect of uh, uh, Ophelia's presentation. I think we have one. I think we have one we have question. One. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, it sounds like when you're trying to assess whether to take on some business, you have to calculate a lot of scenarios, which uh, which yellow box the risk ends in, etc. Do you have time? in the sales process to do this with formal models or is expert judgment used for this? Well, I would say there's, there's some expert judgment everywhere. <laughs> so mm -hmm. any calculation that we do is 
always, there, you know, let's not kid ourselves. There's always some expert judgment in, in the assumption setting and, and all of that. You know, clearly, we don't do all those calculations for each and every transaction. So over time, and with, you know, by doing the calculations with certain subsets of portfolios, we were able to come up with, with certain guardrails and, mm -hmm. and guidelines on, you know, what business typically should go here or there. I'm not saying that's then always optimal, but it usually works reasonably well. Mm -hmm. Only when a deal exceeds certain thresholds, only then mm -hmm. would we go back and then do the calculation for that particular transaction to make sure it's 100% right there. Because what goes well where also depends on what is already there, because that yeah. depends on the diversification which may change right. if you write a large transaction. So that's why as long as everything is small and within certain frameworks, we can we can work by certain rules. Mm -hmm. It's just when when the larger transactions come in that could actually mm -hmm. move the, the needle on our portfolio, then do we have to go back and do all the calculation again? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, when I was listening to your presentation, I had the feeling, wow, it, it's, it's quite complex and it looks like you have to solve and a 12 star Sudoku puzzle, more or less, with all those constraints <laughs> where you have to take account. And a moment I was thinking, and where is now the risk management? Because you have to optimize the taxes, you have to arbitrage all the regulations. Then they're thinking, yes, and when you have solved the Sudoku, are you then also certain uh, that you have enough capital for facing the risk where you are exposed to? And of course yeah. you are, because that is how your model is working because you have an internal model, but I found that that was what, what came in my mind. I, I have one small additional question, if the time allows for it. You said there are 50 regulators in the US. Are you operating then with one license or with 50 licenses? Well, you start with your license in your home state. Yes. And then there's this accreditation process that allows you to operate in other states as long as you fulfill certain requirements. So, and then, yeah, that's pretty much. Okay, so you have their arbitrage possibilities No, it well. is, yeah, it is. Sorry? You have arbitrage possibilities in those 50 states? I don't like the that word you... arbitrage, really. Okay. <laughs> okay. Arbitrage seems like we're making money by, by you know, taken advantage. To me, arbitrage always kind of steers in the direction of not holding enough capital because some regime would allow us to do that. That's not what I would recommend to anyone to do. I mean, you're in the starting point is always our own view the internal model. And we want to hold yeah. enough capital for that. <laughs> and then we look at which state, which country allows us to do that and not hold a ton more that we would consider mm -hmm that we exactly. would consider redundant. So that's why I'm kind of half allergic to the word arbitrage because it's <laughs> it, yes. it's not what I would rec recommend doing. It's only that, um, that it can help. For sure. yeah. So really Thank when you. it comes to different states, when it comes to different states and how exactly they implement certain laws, it's really the, it's very small nuances that sometimes make a big difference. So one of them, it's kind of interesting if I've, I've mentioned collateral requirements. Mm -hmm. So while when you're in the US, from one state to the next, you don't have a requirement to keep like collateral in one state when you see the business out as long as it stays in the US. Okay, so those requirements um, only kick in once you go to a different country. However, um, some states have implemented the credit for reinsurance law in a way such that if the sedent, so if our client, not us as a reinsurer, mm -hmm. but if the sedent gets into financial difficulties, then all of a sudden the reinsurer, who is in perfect financial shape, you know, and is absolutely in a position to pay claims at all times when they're due, but then all of a sudden, because the sedent is in trouble, the reinsurer has to post collateral. And okay. that's like, Wait a minute, you know, so that could be, it's very small and you really have to read the fine print, but then we have to get into, well, do we even want to write 
business and with who do we want to write business in the state? If that's the case, then we have to look a lot closer to the financial stability of our client. Although it's us paying the claims, but we have to make sure that they're not yeah. in trouble because otherwise we have to post collateral. So it's like, it's these small nuances more that um, could make a difference. Yeah. But the general framework is the same or very similar. Okay, thank you. Very good. Well, thank you, Ophelia. I, I think we're pretty much out of time. Um, uh, so thank you for your uh, excellent presentation and for uh, defending your corner uh, uh, well in the uh, Q&A.